Welcome to episode 169 of the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol and spend every waking moment of my time helping other people do the same. That is it. I nearly forgot it then. I'm, uh, look at me. If you're watching via video, I'm crippled. I burned my uh, right hand on a spoon, which was conveniently turning into molten lava on top of my oven and I picked it up and I couldn't let go of it it was stuck to my hand so my mother-in-law who used to be a, a nurse apparently I learned today has um, covered it in aloe vera and I've got all sorts of contraptions on it so I can't actually do any typing so I decided I was going to hop on here and do a podcast uh, make the best use of the time as I can and we're going to do a book review and it's an unusual one. It's uh, This Is Marketing by Seth Godin. You might think to yourself, marketing? What's marketing got to do with being someone who doesn't drink alcohol? Well, there's a lot about what Seth Godin says about marketing, which is exceptionally important when it comes to understanding why we drink alcohol and become addicted to it. And I'm not talking about the very kind of like basic fact that billions of dollars a year are spent on marketing in order for us to drink alcohol. I'm on about influences and strategies and thought processes that go much, much deeper than that. So I believe that no matter what we're doing in the world, whether we are focusing on our business, trying to increase our status within our friendship hierarchies, whether we're trying to quit an addiction, pick up a new hobby, whatever it is we're trying to do in life, marketing will be there or thereabouts. It will be an important facet of it. And we are marketers. All of us are marketers. And we're marketing every, not every second of day, but we're marketing every day. We're, we're doing something towards marketing on a daily basis. All right. So what I've done is I've just highlighted a few of my notes uh, that I've um, scribbled down in his book and I'm going to talk about a lot of them will be quotes and then I'll just talk about them a little bit and uh, yeah if you get any questions give us a shout obviously it's a book that I highly recommend um, so first of all he talks about tribes he actually has a book called tribes which I read a long time ago I think is uh, pretty cool and he says if you want to make change if you want to make change begin by be- by making culture Begin by organizing a tightly knit group and begin by getting people in sync. If you want to make change, begin by making culture. Begin by organizing a tightly knit group and begin by getting people in sync. And as you know, at the truth about alcohol, we want to create a movement of a million people that don't drink alcohol. And in order to do that, we need to focus on the culture. And if anybody listening to this has taken the truth about alcohol intensive before, then you'll know that's what we focus on culture and our worldview and our belief system, everything that surrounds that kind of topic is a crucial fundamental building block of learning if you want to become someone who doesn't drink alcohol. Absolutely uh, crucial, okay? And that is what we're doing at the True About Alcohol and that's what we're doing at Strive is we're trying to organize a tightly knit group of people as we can, like the, the smallest viable group of people that we can that are all in sync, that all have the same philosophy, that all believe the same thing, that all feel like a little family. That's what we're trying to do as Strive. That's what we're trying to do as a Truth About Alcohol. And it's important to recognize and understand that when you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol or you start that journey and you don't have a support system like Strive in place, then you will not have a tightly knit community because it's very likely that your tightly knit group of people will not understand why you suddenly have decided to become an outlier, why you suddenly have decided to stop drinking alcohol. And you will be out of sync with them because your culture suddenly, or the new culture that you're developing, is going to be vastly, drastically different to the culture that they have. You know, if they're drinking all the time, that is their culture. It's a drinking culture. You heard that saying before. If you're not drinking anymore, you're no longer part of the drinking culture. And what tends to happen um, with human beings when it comes to tribe, you're either in the tribe, baby, or you're not in the tribe. You know, and it's something that my son is experiencing at the moment. 
going through his A levels. They, the 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 group there have, have splintered off. There's there's a group of people who are really trying hard, super hard, getting straight A's, really wanting to get into um, Oxford and Cambridge and all these different elite universities. And then there's just a few of them who are struggling a little bit and. And because of that, they're questioning whether or not they want to actually go to college or university, which means they're no longer part of the tribe because they're no longer part of that conversation. Um, it, you, you'll find aspects of this all throughout your life, but it really does um, appeal uh, to me when I think about alcoholism as an invisible, violent, dominant belief system. Uh, he goes on to talk about the network effect. If you deliver enough value, so if a company delivers enough value, like true about alcohol, if we deliver enough value, then your people, strivers, will tell more people. Okay, so he's saying the network effect in marketing is really important. All right, what Seth is saying, and he's a, he's a great kind of singer of this song, if you like, a good preacher of this, is... Yeah, mass marketing and all that kind of works. But if you really want to do the work, if you want to create something of value and lasting change, something that's like really means something, then the way to do that is by one person at a time. The smallest viable market, which is what we're going to talk about in a little bit. Because Seth believes if you have something of value, if you have something of quality, then somebody experiences it and they experience trust, they experience like, this a status and attention, everything around the way that Seth markets, it makes them feel special, then they're going to go and tell somebody else. So if you create an absolutely fantastic pair of trainers or sneakers that feel super duper comfortable, that are vegan um, and are quite cost effective and make you run the 100 meters uh, sprint in like nine seconds, then it's likely you're going to tell other people who are similar to you or are interested in those values to buy those trainers. But here's the thing. Strivers, in general, don't tell other people about Strive. Why do I know that? Because with the exception of Candice and Clint... I can't remember ever someone in Strive or someone turning up on Strive or Truth About Alcohol and saying, I am so glad I'm here. I can't wait to listen to your podcast. I can't wait to take your taster. I can't wait to take the intensive. I can't wait to get immersed in Strive and start feeling wonderful and amazing as someone who doesn't drink alcohol because... X, Y, or Z told me that their experience was so fantastic. And that is a really important point to think about because every single member of Strive who has taken the taste of all the intensive will tell you that it's changed their lives immeasurably. We're not talking about trainers here. We're not talking about headphones. We're not talking about football tops. We're not talking about video game consoles. We're talking about going from someone who drinks alcohol to someone who doesn't drink alcohol and the feeling that invokes, the paradigm shift, the changes in your life that means everything is different all of a sudden. People call becoming somebody who doesn't drink alcohol as the most important change in their life, then why aren't they telling people about it? The fact that they're not telling people about it, and they might be telling people about it, but they cannot be selling it. They cannot be selling it as the world's greatest thing because if they did, more people would be showing up on Strive. And that tells you something, doesn't it, about our need, a desperate, desperate need to become or no, remain a member of our tribe. I'll talk about it a little bit later on, but Seth points out that status, okay, status, our status, our hierarchical status, very often there's a lot of inertia around it. We, as human beings, would rather stick with the status quo of our status, so our status doesn't change, than it increases or decreases. So we would rather not tell anybody that we have made this fundamental change in our lives because we're so afraid of our status changing. 
That is the power of alcoholism is a visible, violent, dominant belief system. And if we want to create a movement of a million people, if you want to be part of that movement, if you want to be a, a role model for your children and everybody else's children, if we want to really win this war against alcoholism, we've got to start talking to more people about it. We've got to start showing them how wonderful it feels to be somebody who doesn't drink alcohol and then point them in the direction of strive, the truth about alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, this naked mind, one year no beer, William Porter, Bell at Tired thinking about drinking, Soberistas. We have to talk about this because if we don't talk about it and we're not talking about it, it's showing me that alcoholism is still winning. We're still afraid. We're still afraid of people discovering who we are. We're still afraid of people discovering what we think. We're, we're afraid of people discovering what we're talking about. But that's not what we're about at Strive. That's not what we're about at The Truth About Alcohol. We're about radical authenticity. We're about radical honesty. We're about turning around and explaining to people how we feel and being comfortable with that vulnerability. That's what we are about. So let's talk about it. Let's sing it. Let's shout it from the rooftops. Seth says, when in doubt, assume that people will act according to their current irrational urges, ignoring information that runs counter to their beliefs, trading long term or for short term benefits, and most of all, being influenced by the culture they identify with. Say that again. When in doubt, assume that people will act according to their current irrational urges, ignoring information that runs counter to their beliefs. Trading long-term for short-term benefits and most of all being influenced by the culture they identify with. Sound familiar? That, ladies and gentlemen, that statement is why you found it so difficult to become someone who doesn't drink alcohol or you are finding it so difficult. All right? And it's important to recognize and understand that when you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol and you're surrounded by people who haven't changed. So your sphere of influence, those that are closest to your inner circle, they haven't changed. Then you need to understand, OK, that they will give in to their irrational urges. All right. That they will ignore information that runs counter to their beliefs. That they will um, trade. They will not trade at long term value for short term benefits. All right. And they will continue to be influenced by the culture that they identify with. So if we understand that, then that stops us trying to push our new beliefs and our new belief system upon them. Now, you might think that that sounds a bit contradictory to what I just said in terms of us shouting from the rooftops about strife. We can only do this when when we feel that people are ready to hear us. And the best way of doing that is not by... Um, just going up to somebody and, and suggesting it, it is wait until somebody starts to get interested in what you are talking about and about who you are becoming, about how you are feeling. OK, if you have stopped drinking alcohol and your partner, the person you share a bed with hasn't, then you need to understand that they're still going to be incredibly affected by the culture that they exist in, a culture that you are very slowly but surely going to start leaving behind. And uh, Beyond Beliefs by Melanie Joy is a fantastic book for getting into the nitty gritty of that. Um, he says you can make two mistakes here. One, you assume that the people you're seeking to serve are well-informed, rational, independent, long-term choice makers. And two, you assume that everyone is like you, knows what you know and wants what you want. Now, this is a mistake that I make quite a lot in when I'm talking and, um, and why I sometimes have a lack of empathy is I, I get caught up in my own mind thinking the whole world thinks like me, okay? Um, I need to, like, continually learn and understand that not everybody is as well-informed as I am about alcoholism as an invisible, violent, and dominant belief system, okay? We, we cannot make those assumptions. We need to, if you take the intensive, for example, we have an assignment called the deaf effect a phenomenon uh, created by Jerry or talked about by Jeremy Griffith, the evolutionary biologist who wrote The Species of Denial and Freedom. And, and the death effect is a really important assignment to go through. It's a really important part of the philosophy that 
people who don't understand that they are in the midst of alcoholism being invisible, violent, dominant belief system, they will not hear you when you try to tell them that it is. Using Plato's allegory of the cave, um, which is another assignment, they're still stuck in the cave. Like, they're still stuck in a cave, chained to the wall, looking at the shadows, thinking that's real life. And you're trying to drag them out into the sunlight, forgetting all the time how difficult that was and how painful it was for you to adjust to the light when you first became somebody who doesn't drink alcohol, okay? You cannot assume that everybody wants what you want, that everybody wants to do what you want to do. People drink alcohol and become hooked to it because it is a very powerful drug, okay? But that drug addiction creates a real need and a real thirst for this stuff. People, look, you sit down and talk to someone who's addicted to alcohol, on that spectrum, in and around how you used to be, and I'm not talking about at the lower end of the spectrum where you're pissing your pants and you're homeless and you're real fucked up. I'm talking about the person who goes out every weekend and drinks about 16 to 20 pints, thinks it's absolutely normal. They love alcohol. They love it so much. That is why it's so difficult for us to quit. So, like, how can we shouldn't assume that everybody thinks like we do, that alcoholism is an, alcoholism is an invisible, violent, dominant belief system. Using those words is probably the last thing you want to do when someone says to you, why have you given up drinking, mate? Because in order to engage with this other person, for them to understand how you feel, we need to steer away from the rationale and from the logic and mix more into the feeling side of things. Just just tell them how you feel. Like, how, how does it make me feel to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol? That way you don't have to engage in a debate. They can't debate with you how you feel, right? You just say, look, I don't drink alcohol anymore. I tried it for a little bit. I feel fantastic. And there's no way that I'm going to go back and drink alcohol again, right? Super duper important. Seth Gordon says, I am not rational and neither are you. And even the most rational amongst us, and I'm an affected altruist, so I can get quite, irrash- I can get quite rational and logic, yeah? logical. We still are driven. We still are stirred by those emotions. So we need to be really aware of them when we are communicating with people about alcoholism being invisible, violent, dominant belief system, about our decision to stop drinking alcohol and our decision to become part of this movement. Okay? Emotion will run the roost. We need to be aware of that. Um, Seth, like I said earlier on, talks about the smallest viable market a lot. He's just basically like, find 10 people... Um, sell them on your idea, um, convince them to trust you, and then those 10 will go and tell another 10, and another 10, and another 10. And he he asks some really good questions that I want you to think about. Um, Either stop the recording and think about them, or ask you, or note them down, or replay it, but think about these, okay? What change are you trying to make? What promise are you making? Who are you seeking to change? And do they share your belief? Okay. But I think that these are important questions to ask ourselves when we first start out thinking about becoming someone who doesn't drink alcohol. What change are you trying to make? What promise are you making? Who are you seeking to change? And do they share your belief? Okay. That, if as you can see, ventures a little bit into again. Um, if I have now stopped drinking alcohol and I want to influence somebody else to do it, do they share my beliefs? You know, who are they and why are we seeking them to change? Really super important questions. And his views on the smallest viable market, I think, can be used for the people who suffer with loneliness. So loneliness is one of the top rated reasons why people drink alcohol. Very often people get loneliness and boredom confused. Uh, but they drink alcohol to cure either one of them. And um, obviously the, 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 the way out of this, the solution to loneliness, not so much boredom because it's different, but the solution to loneliness is to go out and find some connection, is to make connection happen, okay? Um, you are not going to make connection happen by drinking alcohol. And y- you're not really going to make connection happen if you're lonely and loneliness is an issue for you on a large scale. It's much easier to think in terms of the smallest viable market. So so you could say to yourself, for example, why don't I just try to make one friend, just one friend that I can connect with? Why don't I try to do one event, one event where there's people who are like me? 
So if health and wellness is your thing, if that's your vow, and I hope it is, if you want to be somebody who doesn't drink alcohol, then perhaps a yoga class on a weekly basis, not different yoga classes, but the same one. So you can then get to know people and then just focus on building a relationship up with one person, okay? Uh, I think that's super, super important. Uh, the other thing that Seth talks about when it comes to the smallest viable market, and it's something that we've been talking about with moderators, me and Serena had a conversation about it this week, is um, this idea that what we're selling is not for you. So a lot of you will know that I actually began work to help people become people who don't drink alcohol in 2009. It's 2018 now. So what's taking me so long? Yeah, I want to create a movement of a million people. And in the past nine years, I've probably created a movement of 30 people. Why am I taking so long? Well, it's because I've been trying to influence and change the whole world. That has been my focus. The world has been my focus. 7.5 billion people has been my focus. What I've learned through Seth Godin's marketing seminar, the bootstrapping workshop, and this book, This Is Marketing, is that I need to really focus down on the smallest viable market. There are people who are not going to jive with me. Uh, Liza says all the time, oh my God, I hear you talking and ranting and shouting and the speed at which you talk. You must put so many people off. I wouldn't want to listen to you. I want calm and equanimity, equanimity and, and, and chill with the still. And she's right. But I can't change the way I am so I can become someone to that group of people so I can attract Liza. Uh, let's say if Liza starts uh, drinking tomorrow and, and that develops a problem. Well, she's not going to come to me for help. Because I'm not like people like us do things like this. She's not people like us. She's not like me when it comes to how she wants to do this kind of stuff. So people, I have to stop worrying about people not liking me, not liking my tone, not liking my philosophy, not liking the fact that I swear, not liking the fact that I'm loud, etc., etc. And just be comfortable with the fact that this is not for them. The truth about alcohol philosophy is not for people who've got Alcoholics Anonymous, is it? Because we don't believe that alcoholism is a brain disease. We believe it's an invisible, violent, and dominant belief system, for example. Okay? We're not really a place for someone who just wants to stop drinking alcohol. We're a movement of a million people who want to make an effective change in the world. We are people who don't stop at just becoming someone who doesn't drink alcohol. We want to go further than that. We want to be a, a moderator at True by Alcohol. We want to spread the word. We want to talk about it. We want to affect a greater change. We want to serve others. We, we want to continue doing this. And there are so many people who come to strive the True by Alcohol and they turn around and they say, do you know what, Lee? I'm absolutely sick to the death of talking about and thinking about alcohol. It's driving me nutty. Well, guess what? This might not be for you because of the truth about alcohol and strive. We talk about alcohol a lot. We have to because we're trying to make a massive different in, difference in the world. OK. Why is this super important? Well, let's say. Let's say somebody joins the January taster. OK, somebody joins the January taster and that person who joins the January taster really doesn't understand what we're about at the Truth About Alcohol and Strive because I haven't done my job properly in terms of marketing what we're about as a movement in the podcast, in the blog posts, in uh, all of our um, media, right? And I spend three weeks working super, super diligently and really, really trying to help this person in the taster. And at the end of three weeks, they turn around and say, this isn't for me. I ain't got time to do this. This isn't a priority. I don't want it anymore. Now, I've just wasted three weeks that I could have spent with someone who desperately, desperately needed my help. Desperately needed my help. And even now on Strive, with about 30 people who, who pop in and out every now and then, who, there's about eight people doing the intensive, there's six people doing the taste of drill, doing some solid work. Seven moderators are always in and out, helping out. We've got about 
seven or eight strivers who are checking in on a regular basis. I can't get around all of them. Those are people who are actually, they are people like me. They are this smallest viable market. They are the movement, the the germination, the seeds of what is going to become a million people. And I can't help them if I'm helping other people who don't buy into our philosophy. So we have to be a very tight knit group. That's That's why we charge for everything. That's why we charge for everything. It would be highly unusual for anybody anymore to get anything for free. It, it just doesn't work. It really, really doesn't work. There's not enough tension involved in the process for someone who gets something for free to turn it into a paradigm, uh, paradigm shift, a major change in your life. It just doesn't work. Like my, The evidence just shows that. There needs to be skin in the game. You've heard me talk about this before. So if you ever listen to this podcast and you think, why is that guy banging on about helping people and creating a movement of a million people and he charges us £5 a month to join Strive. He charges us £100 uh, to join his taster. He charges us £1,000 to do his intensive. He charges us £100 to do his taster and Annie Grace gives it away for free. Who is this guy, right? There's a reason behind it designed to make sure that we get the right people. It might not be for you. Super duper important part of um, this is marketing for me. He talks about the desire for gain versus the avoidance of loss. The desire for gain versus the avoidance of loss. Super important. There's an assignment in the intensive called the future you. Okay, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make who come to Strive and one of the reasons why they don't communicate effectively enough with those around them and really make um, really make use of the platform they're creating through their own inspirational change to be like a super duper megaphone and to get more people to come to Strive and the Trooper Alcohol and stop drinking alcohol is this this. Avoidance of loss, this this avoidance of loss being the number one priority. And I'm talking about the avoidance of loss of status. So I've given up, let's say I've given up drinking alcohol, but I don't want to tell my friends I've given up drinking alcohol because I th- I'm worried they'll think that I'm a bit of a pussy. They'll call me names. They'll think I'm a big girl's blouse, right? If that is going to happen, if that is how we're thinking, then it's only a matter of time before we eventually start drinking, because we haven't really made the change, we haven't made the leap, we we are not people like us do things like this, as Seth Gordon says, we are not people who don't drink alcohol, you can't be people who don't drink alcohol if you're afraid of telling people you don't drink alcohol, you might be someone who stopped drinking alcohol, but you're not someone who doesn't drink alcohol, for me they're two different things. Someone who doesn't drink alcohol, that is like, that is a whole new value structure. That is a whole new species of human being. That is someone who shouts loud and proud, that, that, that talks about the gain and talks about how wonderful they feel and talks about pulling in the future you. So we work on thinking into the future about how we will feel when we become somebody who doesn't drink alcohol and learning and understanding that our brain doesn't under, doesn't know the difference between actually being someone who doesn't drink alcohol and all those wonderful feelings and actually thinking about it. So we can learn through meditation, thanks to Joe Dispenza and breaking the habit of yourself. We can, we can meditate and we can actually feel right now that we're someone who doesn't drink alcohol, even if we haven't stopped yet. And, and, and the brain and the body will adapt towards that, just as if it's happened. But you can't do that if you're focused on loss. If you are focused on loss and the avoidance of loss, loss of friends because I'm, I'm not drinking anymore, loss of the good time in the pub because I'm not drinking anymore, loss of my good friend wine because it's my boyfriend or my girlfriend, loss of the buzz, loss of the taste, loss of every single perceived value you think alcohol has on you. If you focus on that loss, then what you're doing is you're saying to yourself, that's what I want. I want more and more of that loss. You want more and more of the neurochemical um 
neurochemicals that get poured down to your body from the limbic brain telling you loss is bad, making you feel really shitty. Okay? We don't want to do that. So when we when we look at this outside of it, right? If we step outside of this goal to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, we really need to be switched on to understand that this cannot come from a place of lack. Okay? It really, really needs to be a super positive, charged, vibed up thing, right? There's a chapter that uh, Seth calls the riff about the quarter inch drill bit. And uh, Seth says, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill bit. They want to buy, they want a quarter inch hole. People don't want to buy a quarter inch drill bit. They want a quarter inch hole. But that doesn't go far enough, says Seth. Nobody wants a hole. What people want is the shelf that will go on the wall once they drill the hole. Nah, actually what they want is how they'll feel once they see how uncluttered everything is when they put their stuff on the shelf that went on the wall. But now there is only a quarter inch hole. Or perhaps the increase in status they'll feel when their spouse looks at the work they've done and the beautiful shelf. Or the peace of mind that comes from knowing that the bedroom isn't a mess anymore and that it feels safe and clean. Seth then rounds that off by saying, actually, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill bit. They just want to feel safe and respected. And it's the same with alcohol. If we, on our mission to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, focus on the alcohol, we're missing the point. We're focusing on the quarter inch drill bit. We're thinking that it's the alcohol that is, or the lack of alcohol that is providing the value. In the true about alcohol taster, we get a little smidgen of this, but in the intensive, we stomp all over it. The, the way that you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol without craving, okay, is not to focus on the alcohol. It's not to focus on the quarter inch drill bit. It's to focus on what we truly want out of life. It's to think a lot more holistically. Is to take a greater vow than to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. Like, the vow is more than that. Like, for me, the vow is I, I take the vow to be as healthy as I can be. And if I take the vow to be as healthy as I can be, then I have to live that life. If I take a vow to live a life of integrity, then alcohol has no place in that life. Say with health, alcohol has no place in that life. So... When it comes to staying stopped, the toughest part of this gig, okay, it all boils down to not the quarter inch drill bit. It's it's what how our feelings around the quarter inch drill bit. How how what are our feelings around being someone who doesn't drink alcohol anymore? What does that feel like? And this is something that I'm guilty of not doing enough of in my marketing myself and I think it's because I stopped drinking alcohol eight years ago so I've forgotten what it feels like in that moment the excitement and the love and, and the brilliance of being someone who doesn't drink alcohol and today nine years later I take it for granted it's just who I am so it, it doesn't come natural for me to say to you do you know what I feel fucking brilliant that I don't drink alcohol I feel so fortunate and grateful every day that I made that decision because since I made that decision I have created a group of friends okay around me where that alcohol isn't important to them it's not important to them and their social life I've created a group of friends where connection is the most important value to them I managed to find a wife and fall in love with somebody who drinks very, very little alcohol, whose values do not center around alcohol. And I was fortunate enough to have a child with that woman when I wasn't going to have a child in my first marriage is somebody who one of their core values was having a great time with alcohol. I managed to quit my job of 20 years on the railway and to create a completely different it's not even a job. Like, I have two jobs. I have a job and I have a vocation. My job is I travel around the world interviewing poker players and writing about it. Not a bad job, is it? It's a job. My vocation is driving the truth about alcohol. You know? I feel so much healthier. 
I feel so much more alive. I feel so much more intelligent. I, I feel so much more vibrant. I look so much younger. Okay? I feel like everything in the world is possible. My senses are really super highly attuned. I was watching Creed yesterday, Creed 2, and I burst out crying in the middle of the fight. And I said, why are you crying, Lee, in my head? And I realized I was crying because I have, I am not yet the heavyweight champion of the world. I'm not the heavyweight champion of the world yet. Creed in Creed 2 lost that third first fight because he didn't wholly believe that he could win. There are times when I question my ability to do what I'm doing right now, to question my ability to try to create a movement of a million people. The number one question that keeps coming up into my head all the time is can I make a, a living out of doing my vocation? Can I give up my job of traveling around the world interviewing poker players because my vocation pays my way? And there is something there that is preventing me. There's a blockage there. But I tell you what, I am attuned to it. I am connected to it. I understand it. I see it because I'm not a fucking zombie anymore. I feel these things. And so I can start doing work around them. Okay. These things, these feelings, these are really, really super important when it comes to talking to people about why we don't drink alcohol anymore. It was Adrian from Barcelona who's taking the intensive, who used the term killer statement, having a pre-planned one to two minute statement when someone turns around and says, why don't you drink alcohol? Why don't you want to drink? And very often we think about the rationality of not drinking or the logic in our response, but we shouldn't. We should think about how we feel. We should express how we feel. I don't drink alcohol because I stop one day and I feel fucking fantastic. So I don't want to go back because I felt terrible when I used to drink. So I think that's really important. Uh, Seth talks in his chapter in search of better. It's all about how you feel. And that truth about alcohol strive, we are more logical than that. It's the same with our conversations when we come out of the closet. How does it make us feel? Just talked about that. So no need to go over that again. He says, this group doesn't see themselves as cooks, cooks, cooks. Each member doesn't have a unique theory all alone in a field. Instead, they seek to be part of a small group, a minority group, an outspoken group that can take solace in each other while the outside world ignores them. I keep, keep banging on about the importance of stopping listening to this podcast and making that extra leap and becoming a member of Strive and taking the taster and taking the intensive. Why? Is it because I want to line my pockets with silver? No. It's because by the time you have finished being a member of Strive, taking the taster and taking the intensive, your connections that you have forged and made with your fellow strivers will be so strong, will be so positive that you will not feel alone, that you will not think and feel like the world is ignoring you anymore. But once you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol, you are going to feel and think that the world's ignoring you. You really will. Because the world drinks alcohol and you don't. You are becoming an outlier. You're becoming the minority. So you're going to need help dealing with that. It's a big, big change. I don't care how big your ego is. It's a big, big change. Probably the bigger ego you are, the more difficult it is. He says here, there's a quote I pulled out. Fans came from all over the world to meet the creators of these products and not because the fans were more important or just as important as the person who created the product. Good example he uses is the Grateful, Grateful Dead. It's the dead heads that are more important than the Grateful Dead. At the truth about alcohol and strive, it's, it's not me. It's difficult for me to step away from it. And I can't just completely step away from it because there are people who come to strive. There are people who take the intensive intensive who want to work with me directly. But it's not about me. It's really not. I mean, strive has to be an online movement that eventually becomes Strive Live. It, be, it eventually moves outwards that people come to Strive 
because it's super important for them to meet other strivers, not to meet Lee Davy. To learn from other strivers, not to learn from Lee Davy, right? I think that's super important. If we can accept that people have embraced who they have become, it gets a lot easier to dance with them. Not transform them, not get them to admit that they were wrong, but simply to dance with them, to have a chance to connect with them, to add our story to what they see and add our beliefs to what they hear. That's what we try to do at Strive. That's what we try to do in the taste. That's what we try and do in the intensive. We don't want to tell you that you're wrong. We don't want to poke holes at you. We want to kind of understand who you are and to dance with you. And, and, and similarly, as I talked about before, when it comes to you stopping drinking and being someone who doesn't drink alcohol anymore and those closest to you are still drinking, again, you, you cannot be a battering ram in these moments. You've got to learn to dance with them, okay? You've got to learn to figure out a way to make them your ally. And they don't need to stop drinking to be your ally. They, they don't. There are two things here. There's you... The couple kind of dealing uh, with this difficulty uh, around the conflict around your relationship now that you're somebody who doesn't drink alcohol and they're not. That's one thing. But then there's this other more public thing where you go to a pub or you go to a wedding and people are taking a piss and, and mocking you and joking around you because you don't want to drink, which is making you feel uncomfortable and might drive some of you to drink. In that moment, it's really important that the person you're with who's drinking is an ally. They come through for you. you say, hang on a minute. I know you think you're only having a joke here, but this is not on. What he's done here is a tremendously positive thing. And what you'll find is someone stands up for you like that is the person who's kind of joking. Was ah, I'm only having a laugh. I'll stop it. I'm sorry. But it ends. It stops. And then they, they, they get it in their head. Okay. Uh, there's a chapter called Beyond Commodities. Uh, Seth, what have I noted here down? People might decide that they want a white leather wallet, but they don't want it because it's white or because it's leather. They want it because of how it makes them feel. That's what they're buying, a feeling, not a wallet. Identify that feeling before you spend time making a wallet. Same with alcohol. Before you join Strive, the taster, the incentive, before you decide to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, okay, have a think about how you want to feel. How do you want to feel in life? Forget alcohol a minute. How do you want to feel in life? How do you want to wake up in the morning? How do you want to feel? How do you want to feel in your relationships? How do you want to feel when you go to bed with your wife or your husband? How do you want to feel as a father of your kid? How do you want to feel as the leader in work? How do you want to feel? Okay? And then start doing the work to bring those feelings into your present moment. And if you're really kind of like focusing on meaning and purpose when you're having this little kind of internal quiz about how you feel, I think you'll find that alcohol has no place in their life. Now, if you're someone that hasn't lost control of alcohol, you're not even going to be having these questions, okay? But if you're someone, if you're listening to this podcast, you've lost control of alcohol. Alcohol's got you by the balls, okay? It has you by the balls, right? Or the ovaries, um, and it is, it is, it is the boss, all right. So you need to start to think: How am I going to feel without this? How do I want to feel? I feel so lousy. I feel so shit. I feel so desperate. I feel so lonely. I feel so trapped. I feel so ashamed. I feel so guilty. Stop talking like that internally and externally, and start thinking: I want to feel happy. Or when you're meditating, I feel happy. I feel strong. I feel powerful. I feel in control. I feel fantastic. I feel vibrant. I feel like I'm going to achieve all of my goals and dreams. Completely different way of thinking. On people like us do things like this. The chapter, Seth talks about pattern interrupts. Understanding the patterns in marketing and, and how you're going to interrupt how people are thinking and feeling so a good example is and you'll see this so many times is people will come to strive and they want to become someone who doesn't drink alcohol but they won't stop going to the pub now i'm sorry alan carr god bless your soul but when you said in your book that once you learn the alan carr way of things you can still don't stop going to the pub continue going to the pub Every, you know nothing needs to change 
I don't buy into that philosophy. For me, everything changed because I didn't want to be in the pub, okay? Now, if you're someone who believes alcohol has, has value in the short term and you're going to the pub, then that is a pattern that somebody needs to interrupt. And if you can't interrupt it, then maybe you need help like Strive, okay, to help you, somebody to help you interrupt that pattern. Again, this is where if you're in a relationship with somebody who drinks alcohol and you try not to, where an ally can help with that pattern interrupt. If you go to the pub all the time with your partner, then you and it, and it is creating a trigger for you because it's a pattern that hasn't been interrupted, then you need to have a conversation with this ally so you enjoy your time together somewhere else. And and, and the person can go to the pub on their own. You can go to cinema together or a theatre together or Starbucks together or up your best mates around for dinner together. But to the pub, leave that to people who want to... The only reason people go to the pub is to take a drug. It's a drug-taking den. That's all a pub is. People go to drink alcohol, nothing else. Okay, nothing else. Because if they wanted to go to talk, they would just pop around the house and have a chat. Or they would just go to Starbucks and drink over a coffee. They go into the pub to drink alcohol. End of. All right. Seth talks about with pattern interrupts tension. Tension is a really important one throughout this book. Okay. And he talks about the tension of feeling left behind. Now, if you feel the tension of feeling left behind, and that's going to get connected with your status. And you're not going to want to stop drinking alcohol if you feel like you're going to be left behind. What is much better is for me and my marketing to create the tension of feeling fantastic. But you can do that yourself. Okay, now you've listened and heard this. If you want to become someone who doesn't drink alcohol, then create the tension of feeling fantastic. Give yourself rewards for going a month, two months, not drinking alcohol. That will create tension, wonderful tension. I'm like, oh, when I get there, I can buy tickets to go and watch Frankie Goes Hollywood live. You know, I can go and watch, right, said Fred. I can go and watch Bon Jovi. I can go and watch the Beatles. Yeah, that kind of tension. You can create that yourself. On status, which I think is one of the most important principles that I picked up of Seth that, that ties in perfectly to alcohol. He talks about the Maasai warrior in Africa and how killing a lion is a rite of passage for a young man. Okay. And how that was creating a huge problem in Africa because the lion population was diminishing quite rapidly. And what people had to do is they had to create a pattern interrupt. They had to interrupt this pattern whilst at the same time either increasing the status of the Maasai warrior whilst preserving the life of the lion or maintaining the status quo. And what they did through marketing, quote unquote, okay, was to get the Maasai warrior to see that becoming, going from a boy to becoming a man a much better way of doing that is saving the life of a lion, not killing a lion. So now these Maasai warriors, they come up with ways to save lions, lives, not to kill them. And that is now seen as a rites of passage of a man. That is now seen, okay, as maintaining their status or improving their status. Now, the rites of passage uh, for me and for most people listening to this who are young men, is that we need to drink alcohol. It's a rite of passage. It's getting fucking drunk and acting like a cock is a rite of passage, unfortunately. I was in uh, Berlin. I was in a, uh, a, mu a museum on East German um, history. And, and, and I read there that when kids get to a certain age, or when kids used to get to a certain age in the communist era of East Berlin, uh, in school, they would give them alcohol. Like, the alcoholic drink was a symbol of becoming a man. What we need to do at Strive, and what we're doing very well, I think, is that we are creating a very, very solid message delivered to the smallest viable audience, our Strivers, and you know who you are, folks, okay, that says... Not drinking alcohol, choosing 
to put two fingers up to alcohol is our rite of passage when it comes to being a boy and a man. Not to be a fucking drunken idiot, but to be in control of your senses and to step off and to use that as a spring springboard of a brand new wonderful life. To be an outlier, to be a kook. Kook? I don't even know if that's the right word. To be someone who's different, to celebrate your difference, not to want to be like everybody else. To be a black sheep, not a white sheep, okay? That is what I think is super duper important with what we're doing here. But you need to understand that yourself. You need to be aware of that. You need to really, really be aware that you need to think in your mind that you're improving your status when you stop drinking alcohol and not that your status is going to lessen or weaken. And anybody who has these ideas in their mind, no one's going to like me. I'm not going to have a life. My social life is going to be shit. My wife or my husband will leave me. I don't know I'm going to manage a holiday again. I won't be able to go to my mate's stag do. Anybody who is thinking those things, you haven't got it. You haven't understood the importance of status. You are believing and creating a story. And remember, your brain doesn't know the difference between your thinking and your action. You're creating a story, a way of thinking, a belief system that says, if I stop drinking alcohol, bad things are going to happen. If I stop drinking alcohol, I will suffer lack. If I stop drinking alcohol, my status will decrease. What you need to start saying is, when I stop drinking alcohol, my status is going to increase. I am going to fly to a different level. I am going to feel so much more fantastic. I'm going to look so much more fantastic. I'm going to be so much more inspirational. I'm going to be such a great leader. I'm going to be such a fantastic human being. I'm going to get far more done than I've ever got done in my life. I'm going to be a great role model to my children and everybody else who looks at me, right? That is how we should be thinking. Uh, he talks about semiotics and symbols and the importance of semiotics and symbols in marketing. I want to take this opportunity to talk about our symbol. Someone, I think it was Sue, said the other day um, in the Strive movement, we need a symbol. Like, the Strive needs a symbol. And, and I was quick to jump in there and say, well, we have one. And if you look at any blog post that comes your way, any podcast episode, you'll see our little tree symbol. And I want to just spend a few minutes explaining what that is and where that came from. Because I'm really super proud of it. Because normally when it comes to things like that, I palm it off to other people. And I say, do me a favor, uh, figure that out for me. But this one was really personal to me. You'll see a tree. And that tree is in the shape of a hand. (laughs) Not as screwed up as this hand that I'm showing you. But this is a hand. And it's black. And there are roots. And the roots are really important. Because for me, going back to what we said here at the beginning of this little review on Seth's book, is it's all about understanding all the stuff that's going on under here. The culture, the beliefs, the worldview, okay? Every, that, that is what's driving alcoholism, the invisible, violent, dominant belief system. Those roots. So that's why the roots are there of the tree. Okay? The tree is there resembling growth. The reason that it's a hand is that we're reaching out to offer people our hand, our, our help. Or people are reaching out for us to help and we are there for them. It's black because it signifies Plato's cave. That we currently are in the midst of alcoholism's invisible, violent and dominant belief system. We cannot see the light. We're not ready for it yet. That's why we're reaching out. The leaves are black. But then interspersed with the leaves of the tree, there's some orange. That resembles the sun, the light outside Plato's cave. And any of you who have become people who don't drink alcohol, you remember how unaccustomed you was to the light when you left the cave and how it hurt your eyes and how it nearly almost blinded you. And you were so afraid of leaving that cave, you nearly ran back in. You nearly ran back into the cave. You really nearly had a drink and went back to the way you were. And you will also know that when you try to drag other people out of the cave, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your kids, that that brightness, that dazzling brightness of the truth about alcohol, which is the sun, has been too dazzling for them. And they have run back in there. You haven't been able to pull them out yet because you need to take your time. So some of the leaves are the sun. And then finally, you'll see the raven on top of the hand. And the raven signifies change. And we're all about change. In fact, we're all about 
getting back to who we were before we decided to sell our soul to the devil, before we decided to join the flock, to join the herd, to stop thinking, to be a zombie. We're back searching for that young man, that young woman. Okay, so I think semiotics to symbols are really important. Um, and finally, on permission, Seth says, the hard work of creating the change you seek begins with designing evangelism into the very fabric of what you're creating. People aren't going to spread the word because it's important to you. They're only going to do it if it's important to them because it furthers their goals, because it permits them to tell a story to themselves that they're proud of. Just think about that. I know that when you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol, for many of you, you will, you, you, you will be astonished, angry, sad that you never saw the truth before and eager to run out there and tell everybody about the truth about alcohol. But not everybody's going to be ready. Not everybody is going to be ready to listen to you bang on about how great you feel, how great you are. You're much better just getting on with life, making the right decisions that when people view what you do, they connect it to your decision to not drink alcohol. You don't have to talk about it. I mean, you could talk about it when you're engaged in conversation about it. But there's a big difference between choosing not to go to the pub and instead to go to yoga class than sitting there in the pub banging on to someone that alcoholism isn't a visible, violent, and dominant belief system. How fucking stupid they are that they can't see it. All right? You don't make it about you. You have to make it... You have to help them make it about them. Okay? That's what we try to do at Strive and the Truth About Alcohol and Taster. That's, that's one thing you can do. Is rather than make it about you, make it about send them to Strive, send them to the Taster, send them to the Intensive so they can taste this themselves, so they can get a little sample of how it feels to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. So there you are. This is Marketing by Seth Godin. I hope you found that useful. Um, I know it's a bit all over the place, but it's the way I prefer to do these things. It's a great, great book for so many reasons. I really suggest you buy it. And I also suggest you connect to Seth's blog. I also suggest you buy um, into uh, his bootstrapping workshop and his marketing seminar as well. If you are an entrepreneur or you're a leader of business or you, you know, you've become someone who doesn't drink alcohol and you want to create the, the white space of meaning and purpose, it's fantastic. It makes you feel fantastic to be a part of his um, little movement. His, his It's not so, so much a small, viable uh, audience anymore. Um, so there you are. Uh, before I end on this, if you are interested in becoming someone who doesn't drink alcohol for the month of January and feeling absolutely fucking brilliant, okay, then you should join the January Taster. At the time of the recording of this podcast, it is Sunday, the December 9th. If you sign up, if you go to www.thetroopalcohol.co.uk and sign up before the 16th of December, you will get the Taster at half price. The price has gone up to £100. If you now sign up between now and December 16th, you will get that price for £50. If you don't sign up by December the 16th, the price will go up to £75 until uh, the week after and then the week after that it'll go to 100 we're going to start doing payment on a sliding scale try to do something what Seth has talked about try to introduce some of that tension really important I really want you to be thinking to yourself do I really want to spend this money Ah, do I really have this money that tension is super important because when you find that 100 pounds when you dig it out of nowhere and, and, and pay me, I guess, for doing it, you will be so much more invested in changing your life around. So much more invested in it, okay? So please, 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 come along, do the January Taster um, and get on and get on there, www.thetrooperalcohol.co.uk and do it right now. If you are not interested in the Taster, and the Taster, by the way, is, is, a, is a small uh, group, uh, peer group learning group i i moderate it 
27 assignments. I help you with it. Uh, gives you a brief introduction to the truth about alcohol. If you want to skip all that and you just want to go for it, then we have the intensive. That's a thousand pounds, and you'll be working with me and the other moderators and the other strivers, and the other people that are doing the intensive uh, for a year. Uh, we will be creating over a hundred uh, different coaching videos and assignments, and having a lot of fun, uh, changing the way we feel about life and alcohol and everything else in between. Thank you very much. If you get any questions whatsoever? Let me know. Thank you.